There are some pastors who are wired for that, for doing the counseling, and that's fine. Most don't want to be doing it, yet be, not that they don't want to, but it's draining on top of preaching, leading, all the other things they're expected to do. So taking the counseling load off the pastor and having them not expect to be that person because they're the one everybody wants to talk to, so to speak. Hey guys, Frank here with Tithely, coming to you live with another episode of Modern Church Leader. Well, we may be live, you also might be checking out the recording, but uh, excited to talk about um, really just like pastoral health today uh, with an expert who's been at it for a very, very long time. And uh, I think just because of the last 24 months and you know coronavirus and all the things that pastors and church leaders are going through, uh, it's a pretty relevant topic. So I am joined by Michael McKenzie. Hey, Michael, how's it going? It's going great. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yes. Hey, and I heard a little bit of the Canadian come out right there. Yes. So uh, <laughs> tell folks where you're originally from. Yeah, I grew up in Prince Edward Island, Canada. It's out on the East Coast. So if you go to the very tip of Maine and just go east, you'll pretty much run into Prince Edward Island. And, you, and now you live where? where I live where in you? Florida, but okay. I am the executive director of Marble Retreat, which is in Colorado. I've lived in Colorado the past 20 years, just moved to Florida actually this past summer. Okay. Wow. That's a, I mean, we're going to dig into what you do at Marble Retreat and kind of your years of experience, like helping pastors, doing counseling and, and all the things going on there. Uh, but interesting, you went from like that part of Canada Colorado. Now you're, you're like, I need to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. I need to go to the warm. Sure. <laughs> so do you, do you head up to the retreat often? Like you travel a bit or? How yeah. Does, how does that... From time to time, you know, we're still working it out. You know, it, it was just this summer, but the goal is yes, I will return periodically and I'll actually do the counseling at times. I'm yeah. supervising the counselors that are currently there that we hired because my wife and I did the counseling for the last 10 years. And and okay. so we transitioned out of that role and I, we hired two new counselors who are who are there now and I'm supervising right. them. Well, tell us a little bit about the Marble Retreat. Like when did it start and what's the real focus and how are you guys helping church leaders? Sure. You know, Marble Retreat started in 1974. Lewis McBurney and his wife, Melissa, they were actually at the Mayo Clinic and he was a psychiatrist there at the Mayo Clinic. And he was doing the therapy in the Mayo Clinic and was seeing a lot of pastors showing up there with what he you would call psychosomatic issues. That means they would show up at Mayo with a physical symptom. They would do the complete Mayo workup, find nothing wrong with them. Then mm. they would bump them to psych. And now it wasn't that their symptoms weren't real. They were real. Their GI issues, migraines, you name it. It's just they had didn't have a physical origin. They had an emotional origin. It was stress, to say it bluntly that these folks in ministry were carrying too much for too long. And finally, their bodies were saying, can't do it anymore. So Lewis was in, you know, the counseling department at the Mayo Clinic as a psychiatrist and was seeing pastor after pastor coming through the door. He's a good Christian guy from Texas, you know, and he's like, got to do something about this. They need to go somewhere else. Not They don't have to end up at Mayo. And so he and his wife felt called by God to to start Marble Retreat. It was the 70s, there wasn't much out there to help pastors. They found this property, they built a, a lodge in the mountains of Colorado, opened the doors in 74, and we've been running year round ever since doing intensive counseling, meaning folks in ministry come up there for eight days and we do a lot of hours of counseling over those eight days to come work mm -hmm. on whatever issue. It's really just a safe place for people in ministry to come to know they'll be safe and they can talk about whatever and there'll be no repercussions, so to speak. Right, right. I mean, that's fascinating. Uh, I, not that I'm, you know, the expert in this, but you hear about it like stress, you know, to kind of just use that word to sum up a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but stress, you know, impacting you physically and, and, you know, stuff just going wrong with your body. And now you're in mm -hmm. the hospital because you think, whatever you got these issues but it actually it all goes back to stress and what you're carrying and obviously church leaders pe people doing pastoring and you know counseling in the church and all this kind of stuff are dealing with some uh some crazy stuff at times so mm -hmm. it, it, i guess it totally makes sense and it's also 
kind of a bummer all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when our business is doing good, I have very mixed feelings about it yeah. because I, that means there's a lot of pastors that are hurting, you know, but I'm yeah. glad to be able to be here to serve them though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you were mentioning as we were catching up at the beginning, you guys have served what 5,000 plus like church leaders have come through mm -hmm. uh, since you guys opened back in the day. Yes. Yeah, we run yeah. year round. It's never stopped since 74. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. And do people, so they just book an eight day thing. So you guys have pre-built, you know, you can join the one that's starting on this date and they can basically come to the website, say, I want to come to this one. It's in March. I'm going for these eight days, mm -hmm. schedule it, get out there and, and they hang for eight days and then head back home. Exactly. Yeah. They typically pick it by the date. We do the same eight day model. We don't have a cookie cutter program in the sense that we walk everybody through this step on day one, this step on day two. It's much more organic, natural. Like, what are you coming to work on? We get to know you. Where are the areas you need to work on? But it is cookie cutter in the sense that it's always eight days. We've just have right. found that to be effective. And that's a chunk of time that people can take out of their schedule. It used to be 12 days back in the 70s and that was just so difficult because it really that was 14 days if you weeks yeah yeah and that was just too difficult so we went to eight days and we tested it and it proved to be just as effective as the 12 day model mm -hmm. and um i mean so many questions like i i think uh the sort of topic of mental health and self like taking care of yourself and those kind of things have become much more uh, like common and much more talked about and accepted in, in recent years. Um, yeah, you guys have been at it for a long time, obviously helping pastors uh, and church leaders in this area. What, like, I don't know, what, what do people come see you for? Like, what are some of the things that pastors, I don't know if it's the right question, like they come see you for a lot of things, but like what, what should pastors be looking out for in the sense of like, oh, that's a, that's like a red flag. Like if I'm feeling that or going through that or reacting this way, I should be seeking some sort of professional help in my life. Yeah. You know, let's land on a topic because that'll help me clarify my answer. And our most common issue is burnout, you know, and that's been okay. become, a, you know, a very talked about, written about topic, yeah. you know, and it definitely bleeds into depression. It bleeds into anxiety, but basically pastoral burnout that I've been working so hard for so long, I'm just kind of fried. And so what we see is burnout is a gateway to other problems, whether it's physical or whether it's medicating with something you shouldn't be medicating with. So unfortunately, you know, we do see a lot of pastors because they've gotten themselves into some type of a mess, meaning they've fallen morally, they're abusing alcohol, they're, they've picked up pornography on the side. And so when we start getting their story, most of the time burnout came first because wow. no no pastor gets into ministry and says i'm going to blow it up by doing this or this you know knowing that if i'm caught doing this i'll probably lose my my job or at least there'll be a stepping back you know and working through a process of redemption so all i have to say burnout is is kind of our big topic but it bleeds into other 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 issues right. and so what pastors need to watch for of course there's those far into burnout crisis cases that we've had where the pastor is about to walk up on stage to preach and just has a full-blown panic attack. They have nothing left to give. And they literally have, we've had them collapse on the stage, so to speak, because they've pushed themselves that far. Now, a lot of pastors, you know, either don't get to that point or um, they really should catch it earlier. It would be the goal and the hope. And so some of the things you can watch for as a pastor is, one, of course, am I losing my joy? Am I losing my passion? You know, not just here and there, that's normal, but across the board. I mean, it's really, really a struggle to ever get excited, passionate, joyful about doing what I'm doing. Then it also begins to bleed in. I begin to resent what I'm doing, meaning I don't want the phone to ring. I don't want to go to this meeting. I don't want to have to preach this Sunday or whatever the role may be. And they begin to pick up on even a little resentment within themselves. And oh, I just wish I didn't have to do this, but I have to because that's my ministry, that's my job and all, and all that stuff. So I think that's another thing we mentioned, the physical definitely can play into it. Our bodies will often be telling us things that we're tired, we're, we're 
irritable, agitated, and that, that comes out emotionally and relationally, but also physically, you know, we're, we're jittery, just can't really be at peace, comfortable, relaxed. You know, I just read somebody once said, you know, you can tell a lot by a person if they can sleep well at night. And it's, it's like, can I sleep well at night or am I just chewing on stuff all the time? <laughs> Like describing, you know, my wife when she has like something going on, you know, like there's like, we have some uh, moving happening soon. And so she's been like, that's in her head, right? Like getting ready for, for furniture moving and this kind of stuff. And it like keeps her from sleeping, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like a small thing relative sure. to what we're talking about here. That's, yeah. but you know, when you can't sleep, it does say a lot, right? Something's oh. on your mind. Oh, for sure. You know, and I saw a neuropsychologist um, do a presentation on Bur advanced burnout and they showed where the communication between the emotional part of our brain and the logical part of our brain begins to break down and what that what happens is then the pastor struggles to make assertive clear decisions which furthers their burnout because they get further behind and they're less mm -hmm. confident in making decisions they feel more overwhelmed but as you get further into burnout you struggle to perform more which adds to your stress so to right. speak, you're not feeling on top of your game and you know it and it's piling up and, you know, you just don't feel clear headed because a lot of us don't realize how much we use the emotional part in making decisions. What do I feel like for dinner? Oh, I feel like chicken. I feel like a steak, whatever it may be. You know, there's also a logical part, but we use the emotional a lot in making decisions. And when you get into burnout, you get numb and flat and a certain part of you is not informing another part of you anymore. Like, oh, it doesn't feel right. I mean, I feel like all the books that I've read around like decision making, they're always like, make your biggest decisions in the morning, like early in the day when you have enough emotional energy and, you know, brain power, whatever you call it, right? Like do that sure. stuff early because the later in the day, the more that goes on, you lose that that capability um, over time. And I guess if you extend that to just life, you're you're going through burnout and there's crazy stuff going on or you're helping, you're pastoring and helping other people through their crazy stuff and you're feeling burnout, mm -hmm. like your ability to make decisions just gets harder and harder. Yeah, a couple other things I'd mention is warning signs that you're hitting into deep burnout. One, I mentioned it earlier in a different context, but if you're beginning to medicate to be able to get through the day or the week or the job, there's a problem, you know, right. if, if I'm having to medicate because I can't handle this anymore. And the flip side of that is I'm not doing the healthy things that I used to do, you know, whatever that may be, whether it's mm -hmm. hobby, exercise, community, I'm beginning to cut those out because I don't have the energy to go and go to the gym. But I do have the energy to go get a bottle of wine for tonight, you know, right. and it's like, OK, you know, there's a there's a change. It's a slippery slope. Of course, they don't see it coming. And, you know, I have lots of pastors who come in saying, I've gotten to the point where it is a bottle of wine a night. How did I get there? You know, and that was not what it used to be, you know, right. and, and there's right. so it's very kind of a slippery slope typically. But then there's all of a sudden, now I got a problem on top of my burnout because I have been medicating. Right, yeah. Uh, how do, when do people come to you, right? Or come, right? Like, is it, they're well into this and like, man, it's just the, it's like the end, you know? Like it's almost over and then they go to you or do you find that people are seeing stuff earlier going, man, I gotta, you know, I'm feeling this, I got to get ahead of it. It's both and, and yeah. um, predominantly, and this has changed over time. You know, it used to be nobody came to us, I don't think, unless they were in crisis because you just didn't choose counseling because it was a, a job risk, so to right. speak, to say, right, I'm right. hurting, yeah, I need to go to counseling. Even frowned upon, especially for guys, right? Yes. I'm sure that's still a bit of a thing, but... For sure. For sure. You know, as time has gone on, there is, you know, a growing awareness of the need to take care of your mental health and a growing acceptance even within the church body. So there are more folks who do call us saying, hey, I'm having a sabbatical coming up this summer or, hey, I'm I'm kind of burned out. I'm not in crisis, but I can see this is not going a good direction. Mm -hmm. But I would say it's still probably 75 percent of those who come see us are in crisis. And that's part of the reason, you know, I, I wrote this book recently about don't blow up your ministry is because sitting in the room with a pastor who's just blown up their ministry and their marriage, perhaps, 
and they're just grieving and they're, and they're in lament and they're like, I wish I would have five, 10 years ago dealt with some underlying issues that kept the ball rolling in the wrong direction. And now I'm dealing with all this and it just rips your heart out because they never intend it to get to that point. Their big question yeah. when they walk in our door is always, why? Why did I do this? Why did I, and fill in the blank, whatever it may be. And so we still do have a lot of folks who come to us because of crisis. And that's just not, that's not only pastors, that's human nature. I mean, we we keep doing what we're doing until we have to do something different, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, how was the last, because I, I think about this topic of, you know, burnout or just mental health, emotional health. I mean, God wants us to take care of, you know, all parts of our life, right? Spiritually, physically, mentally, it's all very important um, to be our best for God in all areas. Uh, I feel like the last 24 months has been particularly hard for pastors and church leaders uh, dealing with all the things, COVID and politics and, uh, you know, just everything, right? Like pastors are frontline workers, <laughs> like nurses and and the police and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, that's just a lot of context to like, what have you seen from the pastoral care, pastoral health perspective um, in your line of work? Yeah, you know, def definitely the last 24 months have been difficult for pastors. And historically, pastors have not had a lot of margin, if you want to call it that, in their life, meaning a lot of a buffer around their life with downtime, hobbies, or whatever, you name it. They've been pretty maxed out running at yeah. full. And then you throw in COVID and you throw in the political polarization, you know, that we've been experiencing it. And pastors are, are just very stressed, you know, even more so. And there's a couple of reasons why. One is a lot of pastors are, are people people. And, and, you know, I picked up the phone in the office some point in the last year and um, the pastor on the phone, when I answered, said, if you don't help me, I won't be a, here a year from now. And what he meant was, I'll take my own life. I can't handle this anymore. Mm. And when we when he came to Marvel Retreat and what was going on with him is he happened to be in one of these churches that was split 50-50 down the middle politically. And there were, for years, he'd been able to navigate that when he was making changes in worship, when he was making other staff changes, he learned how to navigate that. All of a sudden, he couldn't navigate it. And every decision, half of the church was mad at him. And it was just tearing him up because he liked being liked. And that's not a bad thing, but it was really tearing him up. All the conflict, all the anger, all the distraction from real ministry, you know, all that was just eating this guy up. So... One thing that's happened in the last 24 months is a lot of pastors have found themselves in conflictual roles. They had learned to navigate changing the color of the carpet, so to speak. Now there's these other decisions. Another part of it is they're making decisions in areas that they traditionally didn't. They used to make doctrinal decisions, theological decisions. Here we are as a church. Here's our stance on this. Here's our stance on that. Something they've studied, something they've been prepared for. Now they're making healthcare decisions for do we wear a mask or no mask? What is really the best there? And they're being pushed out of their comfort zone in some ways. Yeah. And, and so that is exhausting for us as humans to be making these important decisions, but it's not in an area that's our specialty, yet we're looked at to make that decision. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I I, I can't even uh, imagine. Are you get, did Have you seen an uptick in people seeking help in the last 24 months? I get like kind of, not that that's good, it's good for business, but not that you wanna see pastors struggling, but you know, has it has, have pastors been seeking more help through this time? Yes. Yeah, we definitely have seen an increase overall. You know, it, it ebbs and flows at times with flare ups and in, in COVID and stuff and people getting concerned with travel. But overall, right. we have definitely seen an uptick in phone calls, emails, folks in ministry just looking for help saying, I can't continue on. I just can't keep doing this, you know. And so it definitely has increased, I think, the risk the rate of risk of burning out or or getting out of ministry right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's it's one of those things where, gosh, you, you'd want people to be if there's like ever a time where there's a need for great church leaders, 
it's now, right? Mm -hmm. and, and seeing them get burnt out or just feel kind of overwhelmed by all this is is terrible. I mean, it's real stuff, but it's terrible, right? We want we want more of them feeling like they're ready to kind of, you know, charge the hill. Um, <laughs> but it's a tough time. Um, it is. so how do you, how do you help pastors? You know, they've come to you, they've obviously you've done some great work, but I, I assume you want to help them have the tools when they're back in their environment to go avoid burnout, right? Like stay healthy. You know, what are the things that you really encourage pastors to do to, you know, not get back there or for those that haven't been to see you, you know, not to get to that point, how do they stay healthy and avoid burnout? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some burnout prevention things that, that we have learned in this field over the years. The more important thing that I'll get to in a minute probably is how come I'm not doing those things? Because mm -hmm. typically when I say these things, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know that, you know, right. are yeah. you do are you doing it? No. You know? Right. And I even know in my own life, it's easy to set these things aside at times because you get busy, you're doing important things. Things are on the front burner. So I'm not saying, oh, it's easy. Just just do these. I know it's right. a struggle. And, you know, I've had to look at myself various times and say, I'm getting out of rhythm here. Yeah. So some of, some of the things, you know, from a big perspective, you know, it's helpful for a pastor to have a clear job description. And that takes more than just the pastor. That takes the church. But clarity, you know, it's one thing that's been proven. If the if the pastor has a clearer job description, it makes it less likely they'll burn out because it's it's more specific what they're supposed to be doing. You can set better boundaries. You can set expectations that are realistic, all that stuff. But that takes the leadership in the church and agreeing right. with that. Yeah. Another thing is sabbaticals. Sabbaticals are huge and have been proven to be very helpful. So whatever that may look like. And more churches are doing those for a long time. There was a lot of churches really negated the whole topic of sabbaticals, didn't think that was a necessary thing, but it's been proven to show it's really helpful to have that few months off, you know, every six, seven years kind of thing, as well as of course the yearly vacation. Right. It's not, yeah. not in place. Like actually that. take one, you know, turn it off yeah. and, and get yeah. it back. And another thing is taking the counseling load off the pastor. Now, there are some pastors who are wired for that, for doing the counseling, and that's fine. Most don't want to be doing it yet. Be Not that they don't want to, but it's draining on top of preaching, leading, all the other things they're expected to do. Right. So right. taking the counseling load off the pastor and having them not expect to be that person because they're the one everybody wants to talk to, so to speak. And mm -hmm. that varies in churches and the size of the church and, and the culture of the church, of course. But for some pastors, they do a lot of, of counseling and are very drained by it. And then they have to dig deep to try to get the sermon done because I've been spending a lot of hours working with people in their brokenness one-on-one -on -one right. or one-on-two. So those are some kind of big picture things, but then more specifically for the pastor, things like having a hobby. You know, I often will ask pastor, what's your hobby? And they'll say, oh, it's fly fishing. I'm like, when did you last go? Two years ago. And I'm like, that's not a hobby. That's history. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a hobby. That was the retreat you went on once. Uh... Exactly. You know, and I understand how it happens, you know, and so having a hobby, Having a close friend, at least one, if not several, close friendships who are not ministry friends. I mean, they can be in ministry, even within the church or church staff, but we don't just get together about ministry. We can go and we can just have fun and, and just be friends, you know? Yeah, right. Three is physical exercise. You know, there's going to be stress. There's no getting around stress. There's no setting perfect boundaries around your ministry life. So you'll have no stress. No, there's always going to be stress. How do I deal with it? Well, exercise, of course, is very proven to help burn off stress and all the negative impacts it has on your body. So, and sometimes you can join two of these things together, your hobby and exercise for years, yeah. you know, being in growing up in Canada, of course, as you would expect, you can stereotype, I play hockey. I play ice hockey, you know? And so... Wayne Gretzky, let's go. Ah, uh, not not even close, but... <laughs> great player, though. But yeah, not me, that's for sure. I'm more the goon type, really. And, <laughs> and so, you know, for years, my hobby and my exercise was was hockey. You know, I've gotten out of that the last two years, and, and I really need to get back into it. So 
I know myself, as I'm saying this, I need to pick that back up again because it was a great stress reliever after a tough week, going playing a game of hockey and I'm hanging with the guys and we're having fun. And man, it was, it was social. It was, it were burned off stress. It was fun. And I was totally in the zone. I wasn't thinking ministry. Yeah. Like having that, I don't even know if there's something to like a healthy level of like competition, like, right. In, In the context of like, physical activity and sports. And I know not everybody loves that, but I don't know. I know for me, right? Like I need to go, I play basketball and it's a great way. Like I, I don't think about anything else. I'm with some buddies and some of them are church buddies and some of them are just other buddies that I know. Some of them are, you know, buddies from school with the kids. Like, it's just great. We have such a great time and I'm out there competing, sweating, staying healthy. And it's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I have heard it said, I think what you're mentioning, some people have said you shouldn't do team sports because it'll stress you out. And but I disagree. I mean, some people, yes, if they realize that, hey, become a runner or do something, you know, you want to do alone. For me, yeah, I love I love the competition. I love the team sport. I I like everything about it. It's it's really helpful to me to to play that, you know, to play that game and, and get into the competition and just kind of lose myself in it. And so the other thing is, of course, um, having your own devotional life, you know, the the age old, not always pouring into other others, not always going to the word in preparation for a, a sermon or a, a Bible study or whatever, but spending my own time. And that can look a lot of different ways, you yeah. know, from your own time of worship to your own time of praising God and the great outdoors or whatever it may be that really refuels you, keeps you connected, you know, to God. Then the last one, I already said the last one, I'm I'm sounding like a preacher now, but the last one would be um, if married, investing in your marriage, you know, right behind burnout, the next most common thing we see is marital issues. And if you're burned out, your marriage is going to start to suffer. It's feeling it, yeah. Yeah, and, so. and those last two might be in reverse order, right? Like your own personal walk with God and that being, you know, close. And then if you're married, taking care of your marriage. And if you have kids, taking care of your kids, like mm-hmm. in that order, the most important things. Um, and, you know, m- mixing in the hobbies and the other things that you enjoy doing, even with them, right? Mm-hmm. Like trying yeah. to find ways to mix that stuff together. For sure. Um, is, is all important. Like I know I'm just even thinking for myself, like I have to do those kind of things and be intentional about it. Mm-hmm. Um, cause it is hard, right? We're busy and work's busy and then other things can suffer. So you were saying that maybe more importantly is, isn't the list of things to do, but it's why aren't you doing them? So yeah. why, why don't we, why don't we uh, spend a couple minutes on why, why don't people do these things? Yeah, of course. How, or maybe how do they get to, how do you encourage them to do them? Like, how do you get to start doing them? Yeah, you know, again, you're going to get a counselor perspective on this because that's who I am. That's what I do, you know, kind of thing. So I, you know, when folks come to Marble Retreat, the things I just mentioned aren't new revelations. I mean, right. we we know these things. We know we need our own walk with God. We know we need to exercise. We know that we need to have a hobby. We know that we need to have you know, focus on our marriage if we're married and all that stuff. Yeah. So we begin to dig into how come. So, you know, sometimes we'll have to do even an imaginary exercise of, okay, tell tell me about your week. And so let's say the pastor says, okay, I got four evenings a week that are in meetings. I I totally crash on this night because that's, you know, Sunday night or whatever I preach. And then I got these two nights left or whatever. So I'll have a pastor imagine so let's say you say no to one of those meetings. Let, let's just pick one. And let's say you say yes to something else, a hobby. You're going to go that night and play basketball. You're going to go out on a date with your wife. You're doing that thing. Now imagine yourself, what's going to come up in your head that's going to make that difficult to enjoy it, to be totally free. And that begins to reveal some of the sometimes fear that comes up like, oh man, like what what if they make this choice while I'm not there at the meeting? What if they mess this thing up? Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. if what if they realize they don't need me at this meeting? What if well they do need me at this meeting? They they won't figure this out without me. And it's interesting to see the underlying fears, beliefs, lies even that begin to come out when a pastor imagines 
setting boundaries and then delving into one of these areas. And that's where the resistance comes from in doing it, that, that there's some resistance because we know we should be doing these things. We know we'll be healthier people. We'll know we'll even probably be better pastors if we're kind of full of living water, so to speak, you know, right. that, that right. we're full of abundance, not dragging ourselves into church on Sunday morning, totally exhausted. I mean, I go to pastor conferences and the, it's the most tired looking bunch of people I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, I'm looking around. I'm like, these people are exhausted without coffee. I don't know where the church would be. You know, we're just exhausted. Yeah, that's a book title right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I admit I get in the same trap because yeah. we what we're doing is so important. You know, that there are souls to be saved. There's ministry to be done. There's the homeless to help. Whatever we're called into, it's important stuff. Right. So it's so easy to get pulled into. So sometimes that's it. It's like, this doesn't seem important. Being, enjoying day night with my wife, going to dinner and a movie when we could be working on whatever. So do you help them identify, is, is, is the process of identifying those things kind of the big aha for pastors? To like go through that exercise, identify why, why missing that meeting is scary or not doing this other thing is, you know, I'm afraid of that or I, that gives me anxiety. Like helping them identify that, does that lead to them going like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, you know, that's that's part of the aha. It's a, you know, a step. And that is just one window that we open. They, the windows open in various ways, but that's yeah. one window that we open to say, what's what's going on here? Because again, the pastor's burned out. They're burned out because they're not doing self-care. Why are they not doing self-care? Right. What's going on? And it's easy to blame the stressors out there. And that is a part of it. I'm not negating the unrealistic expectations and whatever else. Right. Yet at the end of the day, the pastor is responsible for themselves, you know? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that, that's a window. So then we begin to look at, well, where, where did that kind of thinking come from? Meaning I have to be there. It'll fail if it's not, if I'm not there. What if they realize they don't need me, that kind of stuff. So we begin to look at where did you pick up on that? You know, and sometimes it's family of origin stuff because, of course, as counselors, we love to talk Let's about that. Back. <laughs> oh yeah, we, so it's always the mom or the dad. You know, it's is the problem. But you know, it's you know, but we do look at that. Like sometimes we have pastors come in and they were the hero in their family. You know, that things were falling apart and they stepped up and they were the leader, so to speak, and they got lots of attaboys for that. If we're looking after mom, looking after siblings, whatever the story may be. And so sometimes there's, it's really clear. Sometimes, you know, they were going along normal life, so to speak, no major dysfunction in their home. And then they get into youth group or something like that. And all of a sudden they get noticed for their giftings and all of a sudden leadership stuff gets put on them. And then they get more notice for their giftings and they start eating it up. It's not a bad thing, but it begins to maybe sometimes can cross a line into, wow, people depend on me. Wow, people look to me. Wow, I need to meet their expectations, you know. And so it goes from being a good thing of being noticed for being willing to serve and lead and having some skills and leadership because I've had pastors like, when did this first start that you felt like I have to perform? I have to be on. And they're like, oh, I can tell you exactly when I was in high school and I was going to my youth group and they were like, hey, you, you, man, you, you got something here. God's going to use you in a big way. Now, well, meaning, but it can begin a process if the pastor's not careful of carrying too much on their own shoulders. Right. You right. know, I, I have to perform. That means I have to be at this meeting. That means I have to have the answers. That means I have to fill in the blank. Yeah. You know, and so we help them to track it back to where did this come from? You know, whatever this fear may be. And it tends to land in some big categories. I need to be secure. I need to be adequate. I need to be loved. Those kinds of things, you know, and, and yeah. you know, psychology and philosophy have studied those big heart questions, soul questions, you know, yeah. and it tends to come back to some of those. And then there's a lie wrapped up in it. If I don't do this, I won't be secure, adequate, loved or whatever. 
Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot, I'm sure we could talk for uh, hours on this. You sound like, uh, you're, you're pretty knowledgeable and passionate about it, which is awesome. So I, I appreciate the little bit of time we've got to explore the topic. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love getting to work with, with people in ministry. They by and large are just salt of the earth folks, you know, and they, they you know, they kind of can get painted as a dysfunctional mess. And, and they are because they're humans, you know, like the rest of us. We're, we're yeah, all, we're, we're all, all the same. Yeah. oh yeah, we, yeah. we all are. But by and large, they're just great folks who are really willing to sacrifice for the kingdom and serve and yet at the same time take on things that, that they don't really need to take on. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's end here with just a, a couple of quick questions. Sure. Uh, hopefully rapid fire, hopefully really easy. Um, the first one is you mentioned a book you just wrote, uh, or recently, I don't know how recently, but you mentioned a book, um, give us the name of the book and just a quick little description of it real quick. Yeah, it's called don't blow up your ministry, diffuse the underlying issues that take pastors down. And it's about getting to your own personal brokenness. My argument, I say it in different ways, but if you don't take care of your own brokenness, ministry and Satan will beat it like a drum and it will come to bite you. So you need to be aware of what is my own personal brokenness and how can I make sure that I am, in, in a sense, getting the gospel into there for myself. I'm giving it to other people in their areas of brokenness. And it comes out of my grief of sitting with pastors who have just blown up their lives in ministry. Right. Right. And, and now that. they're like, yeah. Is there a website? Website is marbleretreat.org. I, I don't have my own website. I guess I should. You know, I, I marbleretreat.org, and you can find the book there too. Yeah, as I mentioned, and I, I shouldn't say this because I don't want people to not come to Marble if they need to. But you know, internet is hard to come by up there. So you know, for for years it was it was dial up when I first moved up there, yeah. you know, and now it's, you know, satellite, but it's still pretty slow, you know, where it's getting well, better. We all need to shut it off once in a while. So that's, yeah. that's actually uh, uh, on the plus side of going to the, it region. is unless you live there, then you don't think about having a website, you know, Yeah, but yeah. now yeah. I'm in high speed internet, so I should have a website, but it's marbleretreat.org. It's about the ministry, but also there's some stuff about me and my book and that kind of stuff. Okay. Love it. I mean, it sounds like a great book. Give me another book that you think all pastors should read, something that you've been really uh, inspired and impacted by that they would benefit from. You know, um, to go more recent, because I tend to go historical, so I'm going to challenge myself to go more recent. I like um, On Hurried Life by Alan, is it Fadling or Faldling? I can't remember his last name exactly, but he okay. does a book called The On Hurried Life. And um, I happened to come across it and listen to it, you know, sometime in this last year. And he, he really had some great insights about what the title says yeah. about having an on hurried life, which Love is it. a, it's a constant challenge, but I yeah. think it's a great, I think it's a great, uh, a book. And I think he has some great wisdom in it. Awesome. And last one, uh, give me a podcast that you're currently listening to. Oh man. That's, oh, I can't even answer that one. Oh no, not a podcast yeah. listener. Well, remember, it's been, let me see what month is it? Well, I'm getting closer to six months now that I've had high speed internet for the first time in my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. That's so good. So anyway, I'm driving from Colorado, never listened to a podcast in my life because they limited our data up there. So we only did emails that was all we did on right. on on the internet i mean so i'm like i'm talking 10 15 years behind the rest of the world oh my so gosh you're, i'm driving you're like, to you're just like experiencing life right now oh yeah so i'm driving to florida from colorado and i text a buddy of mine and saying hey i gotta figure out this podcasting one i'm gonna be doing podcasts soon and so get me onto a podcast. So he got me onto this World War II podcast. And I can't okay. remember the guy. I wish I could remember the guy who does it. It was awesome. It was so great. I'm like driving and I'm just listening to hour after hour of this World War II podcast about kamikaze pilots, about different battles. And the guy really got into the psychology behind some of the war that was going on. And it was, it was phenomenal. I'm like, 
I can't believe this. I can yeah, just sit well, here. And... People will have to self-discover. Some podcasts are <laughs> about World War II. Go look it up. <laughs> Go look it up. Yeah, I can't recall the guy's name off the top of my head. I could find my phone and it's on there. but uh, No worries. Well, Michael, this has been great, man. Thanks for jumping on the show with us today. Oh, it's been great. Thank you for having me on. God bless. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening or watching on the YouTube channel or on the podcast. Appreciate you guys. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Modern Church Leader. Bye-bye.